Welcome to the Management Advantage. On last year's pond management show, we looked at some basic pond management tips to help you grow some trophy brim. Well, on today's show, we're gonna look at some advanced tactics. See if we can help you grow something like this eight pounder right here. Y'all, we got a good one plan for you. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Dodge presents the Management Advantage. Gaining the advantage through proper land management with your host, Chuck Sykes, who is dedicated to sound wildlife management practices and principles that will help both sportsmen and landowners get the optimal potential from their land. This season, the Management Advantage is brought to you by BASF, Club Car, Tecamonte Wildlife Systems, Sportsman Choice Record Rack Fees, Lot Saver, Kershaw Knives, C&S Wildlife Services, the Edge Outdoors, Motorola Talk About Series, Great Day Incorporated, and Wildlife Trends. Y'all, before you can produce trophy bass, like we were shocking up at Sedgefield, you got to take a look at the tiniest particle in the food chain in your pond, which is plankton. Without that plankton as a building block for your food chain, you can't grow those big bass. So Kevin, how do we go about establishing the plankton in our ponds? Well, what plankton is, is microscopic algae that's free floating in the water column. And the way to achieve this is through proper liming and fertilization of your pond. Uh, you want to go in and lime your pond in the fall, winter of the year. You want to put about three to five tons an acre. And then you want to start fertilizing when the water temperature gets around 65 or 70 degrees, which is usually around March, first of March. Once you've created a fertile environment in your pond through proper liming and fertilizing, it'll give you that distinctive pea green color, which is a phytoplankton bloom. Once you've created a proper environment to get your plankton bloom, that can create one problem, and that's weeds grow well in that environment. And from the response we got off of last year's show and the questions that Kevin got through email, weeds and weed control seems to be one of the major topics in pond management. So once this environment is created, you've got to be able to control your weeds where your fertilization program can go completely to your phytoplankton and not to your weeds. Now what all can we do to help eliminate our weed problem? One thing is through fertilizing. Getting a plankton bloom will help shade out the bottom. Maintaining an 18 inch bloom will help shade out the bottom for undesirable weeds. Also, you can use pond dye. Pond dye, that, that's for the people who, who not necessarily want to lime and fertilize their pond or may have excessive flow of water through mm -hmm. their pond. They can use pond dye year round and to help shade out the wheat. Okay, and so the object of this is either through fertilization or through the pond dye. It blocks the sunlight from going all the way down to the floor where the weed seeds are and where it grows. That's right. Now the pond dye and the fertilization, that's sort of a in the beginning step to try to keep the weeds from growing. That's correct. Now in a lot of cases, you've already got weeds there now you've got to get them out, and the pond dye in a lot of cases and the fertilization is not going to get them out. So then what can you do? There's two other ways you can do it, by chemically treating it or biological, which is grass carp or white amour. All right, now the grass carp, they're, they're sort of grass specific. Just because it's grass doesn't mean the grass carp are going to eat it. That's right. You want to make sure you identify the weed correctly to see if, if the grass carp will eat it. They'll eat most submerged plants, but they won't eat shoreline grasses and stuff like that. For example, last year at Sedgefield, we had a weed problem in one of our lakes. So we decided to stock grass carp. Now the stocking rate on grass carp is five to 10 per acre for slight infestation, 15 per acre if it's moderately covered. And for heavy coverage, you want to stock 20 to 30 per acre. Well, Maytag Lake was 85 acres and it was probably 60% covered. So we stocked 1,200 grass carp in the 10 to 12 inch range. The reason we went to 10 to 12 inches is because there's large bass. 
Now Potomageton was the grass that we found in the lake. And as you can see, fishing it was a nightmare because of all the grass problems. Well, it didn't take these guys right here very long and they had completely wiped out our grass problem. Make sure when you're stocking grass carp in a pond that has bass already in it that they're large enough that the bass won't eat them. Now y'all, there are basically three types of weeds that you'll find in and around your pond. You've got emerged, which is anything sticking out of the water and around the shoreline. You've got submerged, which is anything below the water surface, and you've got floating vegetation, which is right at the water surface. Now the grass carp are only gonna take care of a portion of your submerged vegetation and some of the floating weeds, but when it comes to the emergent vegetation and the grasses along the shoreline, then it's gonna come down to some type of chemical application to take care of that. That's right, and what we use on the ponds that we manage and recommend is a new product from BASF called Habitat. The first thing you want to do before using any chemical is to read the label and to make sure and identify the weed correctly to see if that's if that's going to take care of the problem in your pond. Right, because every chemical, whether it be one used for submerged vegetation or emerged, one chemical is not going to take care of everything. So first and foremost, you've got to identify the plant that you're targeting and then make sure that chemical is labeled to take care of. That's correct. And what we have down here in the south is alligator weed, pennywort, filamentous algae, duckweed, and cattails. And I mean there's a whole host of others, water lilies and just, oh, yeah. I mean the list goes on and on, but typically that's the ones that you're targeting around here and habitat will take care of most of them. Now once you've identified the plant and you know that you've got the proper chemical for it. You can either put it out, out of the boat or you can use, like I do on a lot of mine, a, a sprayer with a telescoping boom on it that I can just ride around and spray out like that. You can do it with a backpack, but one key to it is being careful how much you spray if it's covered. That's right. If your pond is completely covered in weed, you only want to spray a quarter at a time. That way, whatever you spray, is, when it's decomposing, it's only taking out that much oxygen at a time. If you sprayed the whole pond at one time, it'd take out all the oxygen out of the pond. And it's gonna turn over and From it's gonna kill you fish. It's gonna kill the whole pond. So y'all be careful. You've identified the plant properly. You sprayed it. Be smart about it. If it's covered and you spray all of it, it's gonna zap the oxygen and you're gonna lose all your fish. You just take it a portion at a time and you can get your weeds under control. Now once you've got your basic building block established in this pond with the plankton, that plankton is there to feed small fish, which in turn feeds your larger fish. So to get these bass to trophy size, you've got to put something in there to feed on that plankton. That's right. And the bluegill is one of your main four species fish in your pond right now. What you want to do is go around and put feeders, feeding stations around your pond. This will help increase the numbers of fish and make them more healthy. So you've got more and bigger bluegill in there to get your bass to a larger size. That's right. But your bluegill can only carry it so far if you're gonna take that next step and go to sure enough trophy management on your bass. Yeah, if you want a trophy bass fishery, you'll have to go in and stock alternative species such as threadfin shad. And that's the most popular. That is the number one forage species on the market now. When you start talking about putting in shad, just like on any trophy management, be it bass or deer, the price of poker goes up. That's Those right. shad are not cheap. No, they're not. They usually range anywhere from $1,600 to $1,800 a load. And a load consists of around 22 pounds of fish, which is really only 5,000 to 10,000 fish. All right, how can you justify to a client spending that kind of money to put in just 22 pounds of fish? Well, just like the sage field footage of us shocking up those big bass, I mean, you're not gonna get that kind of, of bass in a pond without stocking alternative species and that many of large bass at one time in one spot. You gotta have something for them to eat and those shad are going to multiply. I mean, you're just putting in basically a breeding stock. That's it, what you wanna do, you're, you're trying to take off the predation off your bluegill. They're gonna create m more fish because that, that bass has something other to eat than that bluegill. And the shad, they're, they're really, pro they're, they're very prolific, they spawn a, a, a lot, but they usually die out when water temperature gets around 42 degrees or below. Okay, so you, you guys up north, 
stocking shad may not be for you. You need to check into another alternative fish species that may be better suited for your area. Down here in the south, like Kevin said at Sedgefield, y'all saw the size of those fish. With the bluegill, the feeders, and the shad, I mean, those ponds are, they're right there at as good as they can uh, get. about as good as it gets around here. Forestry Facts, brought to you by BASF. Welcome to this week's Forestry Facts segment. Today we're going to take a look at the persimmon. Now the persimmon is known for two main things. It's a wonderful soft mass producer in late summer and early fall for many types of wildlife, but it's also used heavily to make premium wooden golf clubs as well as billiard cues. Some of the distinguishing characteristics of a persimmon are these little green flowers that in late summer turn into succulent orange fruit. Now that fruit is used by a host of game and non-game species from songbirds to white-tailed deer. Leaves of a persimmon are alternate, oblong to elliptical, and medium to dark green. The bark of a young persimmon tree is smooth with very little striations and as the tree ages, the bark becomes deeper grooved and sort of looks like the back of an alligator. Persimmon is an extremely adaptable tree. It can be found in a variety of sites from moist to dry, rocky to well-drained and a variety of pHs. In our hardiness zone map, the persimmon can be found from zones four to zones nine. The final thing we want to discuss today is proper record keeping. Y'all, it doesn't matter if you've got a cattle operation, a deer herd, or a trophy bass pond. Without proper records, you don't know whether you're progressing or going backwards. You're taking the time and effort to fix a place up. You're putting a lot of investment in it. Without proper records, you don't know if you're making the improvements at like you're wanting to. And looking at a fish and saying, ah, he's 20 inches long and weighs four pounds, usually that fish is 14 inches long and weighs a pound and a half. You need a proper set of scales and a measuring stick to know exactly what you're taking out and what you're putting back in to help managers like Kevin improve your fish pond. That's right, and the two ways to do that is hook and line and electrofishing survey. All right, everybody knows what hook and line is, that's just fishing. The other way is electrofishing. You hire a professional to come in with their electrofishing boat and sample your lake. This way we can get a collective sample of the fish, your forage fish, the condition of your bass, and your bluegill at the same time. We can tell you whether or not to add forage species, whether you need to take some bass out, or do not harvest any bass this, at this time, or harvest bluegill or don't harvest bluegill. Uh, go in and tell whether or not you need feeders on your pond. Uh, look at weed samples, stuff like that, to let you give you a general idea of what's happening in your pond. So the record keepings have got a whole host of benefits, but the main thing, like you said, is a hook and line. That's just pretty much friends and family or guests out there just jotting down on a sheet of paper what they catch and what they throw back. So if you've got someone managing your ponds, they've got something to look at to give you proper recommendation. But once you put that shocking boat in the water, you can come up with everything that you need to properly manage that pond and help them get the most out of their dollar. That's right.
for those of you who are not familiar with electro fishing, this is just a high tech version of catch and release. It stuns them long enough for us to dip them up, put them in a live well where we can take valuable weights and measures on them, and after we're through recording the data, we can put them right back in the lake. The Management Advantage Email of the Week. Brought to you by CNS Wildlife Services. Welcome to the CNS Wildlife Services Email of the Week. Today's question comes from Adrian in California. And he built a pond and he's wanting to know, is there anything available to seal it or does he need to wait and let it seal naturally? Well, Adrian built his pond last fall, so probably give it a little time and it's going to seal naturally. Being it's only six months old, you're probably in good shape. But if you want to go ahead and take the time to put something in it to help it seal, you do have an option. There's a clay called bentonite, and when it's mixed with water, it'll swell 12 to 15 times, and it'll form a seal to help stop that seepage. That comes in two forms, granular and chips. Granular is used to incorporate into the soil when you're building your dam. Now in your case, you would want to check into the chips. You can walk along the dam or wherever you think your pond's leaking, sprinkle it into the water, it'll go down, find the hole, and stop it up and make an impermeable bond that barring any major catastrophe should be there for a long, long time. Adrian, I appreciate the question. You can expect your cap and video in the mail shortly. Y'all keep these email coming. We may read it on air next week. Y'all, this is proof that proper pond management works. If you've got any questions about anything you've seen on today's show, we're going to run Kevin's number at the end of the program. You can get in touch with him at Southern Aquatics, or you can get in touch with us at the Management Advantage, and we can help you get your pond in good shape. This is just one more way that we're helping you gain the advantage through proper management. We'll see you next week right here on the Management Advantage. Management Advantage, presented by Dodge, was brought to you by BASF, Club Car, Tecamonte Wildlife Systems, Sportsman Choice Record Rack Feeds, Plot Saver, Kershaw Knives, C&S Wildlife Services, The Edge Outdoors, Motorola Talk About Series, Great Day Incorporated, and Wildlife Trends. I go tuck back in the pines where a green field grows my own little paradise I'm thankful for this land and the life that it provides see the measure of a man is what he leaves behind oh, oh take what you need